So, is it okay if I introduce her while and get her starting while you're eating? You okay with that key? That's okay. So Jennifer has been with us. Uh, we were talking about it yesterday. So she started. She came from Ohio State University, and then she moved to Yuma. So she was working at the Yuma Proving Grounds for five years. Wow. Yeah, about that. Right. Wow. That's amazing. And then. Only gold enough to. Be. <laughs> and then came to Arizona State University mm -hmm. in around 2012 mm -hmm. or 2013, and so she was a physics major. And so she had to take, uh, in order to do the electrical engineering thing, she had to take the initial courses, and she took several circuits courses with me, and uh, then uh, hung around long enough for us to say, okay, you're, why don't you start working with us? And uh, so she's had uh, a successful stint last summer with Sandia, where she was helping them integrate uh, Michael's PMCs into their process among other things, doing radiation testing. Mm -hmm. And so then she was able to write her thesis here on primarily retention of, of these memory devices. So without further ado, here's Jennifer. Woo Thank you, Hugh. Um, thanks, everyone. OK, now there's more people. <laughs> OK, you can keep going. Yeah, so thank you guys for coming. And there's a crap ton of food, so please eat it all. Uh, today I'm going to present on the retention of programming uh, a programmable metallization cells during ionizing radiation exposure. And I want to thank my committee, uh, so Dr. Barnaby, Dr. Kuzuki, and Dr. Holbert, uh, as well as MECD for providing all the TCAT simulations for me. Uh, Yago, who's not here, he's a good postdoc. He'd be an awesome postdoc. Awesome postdoc. <laughs> <laughs> he's off with his he's camping. Spanish folks or something camping. Oh, and, okay, okay. and then also I want to thank the Sandia staff um, for letting me use their facilities. So they let me just run free and do whatever. Alright, so I'm going to talk about, uh, I want to explore the effects of ionizing radiation uh, in the programmable mineralization cell. Uh, and then I will show that uh, these devices are tolerant to ionizing radiation up to 10.1 megarad. Uh, and then I did tests for floating and for biased devices and saw no difference in performance, so that's a good idea. And then also I want to show how these devices compare against commercial NAND flash memory. So this is how I'm going to break down my presentation. First I'm going to talk about the device mechanics, so how these devices work, um, how we make them, and then also I want to explain what retention is. Can um, I break in right now? I, there's one thing I did not say. Sorry about that. Um, uh, Jennifer's intention is to make this a master's in passing. So if you didn't know that, um, that's what this is. Okay. Okay. And I got all the forms and everything there as well. Mm -hmm. There's multiple copies in here, so you guys like spilled all around. Or Which way? <laughs> <laughs> all right. So I want to also uh, explain a little bit about what radiation could be doing in, this de in these devices. Uh, and then I want to go through the data I've collected, uh, all the retention during radiation, and then after that I will essentially summarize everything I've talked about. All right, so why are these devices important? Why is it important to study the radiation effects? So we've got this new industry coming up called the Internet of Things. And everything, everyone wants these smart devices that do a lot of processing on the device or send it off to a cell phone. But these devices are getting small because people carry it around on themselves. So right now, a lot of these devices use NAND flash. Uh, and NAND flash is reaching uh, limitations due to CMOS processing, physical scaling limits and such. So we need a better technology, especially if we're going to compete with the, the Internet of Things and things scaling really, really, really tiny. Uh, and then why do we care about the radiation effects in consumer devices? So you go through the airport and you get stuff scanned at the baggage. That, uh, going through security. So that's going to get exposed to x-ray radiation there. It's going to be small amounts, but it's still going to get exposed. Uh, if you leave something out in the sun, uh, usually it's in case, but if you have UV exposure, I mean, you, you can leave stuff outside and you don't want it to die on you. Uh, and then for special applications, say if you want to use these in space vehicles, so what's becoming popular now is those Pico satellites. So they're like maybe like five centimeters by five centimeters 
cubed or whatnot. So you have to fit all of your instruments, you have to fit all your your uh, memory and all your sensors, everything has to fit in that little tiny cube. So you want, if you want, if you're gonna do a lot of processing on that device, you wanna have a lot of memory, but it needs to be small to fit it in. And on a side note, why is my cup talking to my shoes? And why this is relevant Oops. is Internet of Things devices. Yes. One small thing. Huh? <clears throat> you missed one of the uh, the most substantial environments that uh, even consumer electronics ends up being exposed to the potential ionizing radiation. The um, medical devices, or what else? We've got medical devices, and we've got um, aircraft. Oh right, I forgot yeah. about that. Yeah, no, I no. didn't realize. I'm sure Professor Holder knew this, but pilots are classified as radiation workers. Oh wow. Yeah. Bizarre, but anyway. On the average, they get more than if you work in a nuclear plant. Right. Wow. It's astonishing. Well, I know when I worked at Sandia, like, the, if we were told if you had to take a flight to get a different dosimeter, because yeah. <laughs> that would screw up your TLG. Up, yeah. 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 But so, Internet of Things. So, one of the things I thought is funny out of these is they have something called the vessel. It's a cup, and it'll tell you exactly what you you pour into it, and then mm. how much you drink, and your hydration and stuff. And then it talks to your Fitbit, and then it talks to your phone. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, literally everything is going to become computerized mm -hmm. in the next few years. And then also shoes, like it'll track your steps. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm going to get into the actual device mechanics of these devices. So here we have a representation of the active area of these devices. So essentially what we have is a, a silver cathode, or sorry, a silver anode, and then we have a solid electrolyte made out of silver uh, doped into germanium selenide. And then we also have a nickel cathode. And so what happens is when you apply a bi bias, um, the silver in the top oxidizes. So it loses electrons. Those silver become cations, and then they're shoved through the calcogenide um, due to the electric field that's presented by the, the bias. And then it will electroplate on the nickel and then um, reduce gaining electron, and then that metal will build up and then this right here would be what, we, what would be considered a low resistance state. So now you've created a conductive path between the, the cathode and the anode. You've essentially shorted out the device. And then what that filament really looks like is something like this. So it's kind of like this fractal filament that's built up kind of like a little tree between the two, the two contacts. And then if you want to erase the device, I don't have an animation for this one, you just simply reverse the bias. And so the, you have the, the redox reactions that happen again, but this time since the electric field is going up it, towards the, the silver, then all the silver is pulled back out, or at least the majority of it. So here is the switching characteristics of these devices. Let me try to use a laser pointer. All right. So you have this trend here. So this is the actual programming of the device. So say if it's in a high resistance state, so that filament's not there. If you start to sweep the voltage up, there's some threshold where that current will spike. And then usually you use some kind of device. Yeah, this is my green one. Oh, that is great. <laughs> this one's like an 80 milliwatt, so. Oh, don't get it, don't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can, I, can, I can go back to the red if this is going to kill people. Nah. <laughs> awesome. All right. All right. So you hit some threshold, and then you hit a, usually the like a parameter analyzer. You, you'll use a parameter analyzer to sweep the devices. Uh, and so you can set a compliance current. So once you hit a threshold, it caps that current. But then when you sweep back towards zero volts, then you actually see that ohmic response from the device that you've programmed. So the creation of the, the filament. All right, I'm not going to blind you guys. <laughs> All right, and then so to erase the device, again, you have, you want to reverse bias it, so now we have negative voltages down here. So you hit a threshold, when you go into a negative voltage, you hit a threshold, and then this is when the device, the filament breaks, so it starts to dissolve. And then as soon as you, you break that contact, then you have this, like, jump up to the high resistance again. And you can actually see the trend in the resistance. So as you're programming it, you're at a high resistance, you hit the threshold, it's down to a low resistance. And then here's your what your programmed state would actually be. And then when you hit the threshold for erasing, then you're back to the high resistance state. So these are the devices that you made that were crossbars? Yes. This is real data. Yeah, this crossbars. is real data. 
Have you ever taken any um, pulse data on your crossbar? I have not, no. I've been meaning to do that though. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> I'm, I'm, it up I'm asking just for my own. Uh, well, I had set it up to do the test at Sandia and then I just didn't get around to doing it. Um, okay, so I'm going to go into the fabrication of these devices. So, what we do is we start with the silicon wafer and then we deposit an insulating layer of silicon dioxide. And then here we lay down a layer for, and pattern it for doing the nickel cathode bar. So, we're going to etch out that nickel. So, you can see here the nickel's been etched out. And then you have a layer of silicon dioxide that is deposited on and patterned. And this is going to be the actual, essentially the holder for the device. So we're going to cut out a via in that silicon dioxide to deposit the device into. And then here you see, so after we etch that via, we, we put on a layer of resist to do liftoff. Um, and so what that means is that when we deposit the germanium and the, the germanium selenide and the silver, the parts that we don't need, um, essentially get washed away when we lift off, when we dissolve that, that resist. So all we're left with is the actual device down here. But before we do that, we actually photo dope the germanium selenide. So that's how we get the silver in, is we expose it to UV light, and then that silver will migrate through and diffuse into the germanium selenide. Uh, can you help me understand this a little bit more? Lift off. What's, what's happening here? So for liftoff, what you do... Is this after, are you trying to figure after things have been lifted off? No, so okay. here, this is the resist. So the hatch, the, the cross hatching that I have, that's representative of the resist. Uh, so once you deposit all this stuff, so here there's still resist on here, nothing's been lifted off. But if you go to this one, you see all those features, there's aluminum here now, but all those other features are gone. So when you dissolve, that mm -hmm. that resist there. Every time the resist is underneath it, it gets peeled away. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the only part that's going to stick is the part that's sticking to another mm -hmm. metal or semiconductor layer. Sometimes that doesn't always happen. Sometimes you peel it off and it yeah. comes off. Then, right? Yeah, then you're screwed. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> then you start all over again. How often did that happen with your... your with the cross bars, it doesn't happen very often. Sometimes you'll have like sections. So like, for example, like this part might completely lift off, but the rest will be good. So it's, it's usually... <coughs> Usually you don't have the condition where everything lifts off, but you'll have some on a tie. You might have some parts that are destroyed because the pad gets lifted off or something. Um, but here's the finished device. So after we do that lift off, we actually deposit aluminum, an aluminum bar across here uh, to access that silver contact because aluminum is way easier to bond to than silver. <laughs> and then here's an, a zoomed in view of what the what one of the devices looked like. So here's the via that's cut out in the silicon dioxide here. And then here's this island here, which is representative of this entire structure here. And then we have the nickel cathode going this way, and then we have the aluminum anode contact across there. All right, so when we dope it with silver, we try to dope it to 33% uh, atomic concentration. Uh, and the reason we do this is because um, previous studies by Maria and Dr. Kozicki, Maria Makova and Dr. Kozicki <laughs> in 2002, uh, found that essentially that's the diffusion limit. So you, you, it's hard to dope a thin film of germanium selenide past 33 atomic percent. So the reason we dope ours to that amount is so that essentially when we create the filament, the filament doesn't just dissolve away. So essentially we limit the diffusion constant. Uh, and so here is a profile of silver in our devices. So here's the silver anode. Uh, this is the silver. This is about probably about the 33% uh, concentration. And then as you get down to the cathode, there's a dramatic drop off in the concentration. And this area we call about the five nanometers off the cathode here. We call that the silver pore region. And we're not 100%. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> we're not 100% sure why that happens, why we have the essentially like a region where it, it, it's, you can't really get any other silver into. It just kind of stops there. So if you photo dissolve the silver forever, yeah, and ever and ever and ever and ever, would that region go away? I would think so. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I haven't really tried to do that. But I mean, these devices, I would I assume this is the reason that they function so well, so the reason you have such a high resistance state. So if that were true, or if it continued to diffuse in here after like a few weeks or whatever, these devices devices should stop working. 
or at least have a really low high resistance state. So since we're not seeing that, I'm assuming that that region continues to exist. So do you think the silver, this is just speculation, <coughs> I'm just asking you to speculate. Okay. Do you think that the silver that's in there is uh, presenting a positive charge or is it neutralized in the, and when I say neutralized, I mean locally neutralized. Right, well a lot of it, some of it will uh, bond to the selenide. So then that I don't believe has a charge anymore since it's bonded in. Yeah, lo lo I mean, when I say charge, I mean is able to be kind of be seen as a charge outside from the outside world relative to something that's maybe it's still ionized, but it's or it looks like a positive charge, but it's so close to a negative charge that it's essentially charge neutral. So you're saying that it's more that, or do you think it's more kind of a lone positive charge just sitting out there? I don't understand why it would be a positive charge because if it's still able to pull electrons through it could it would neutralize it. So you think that it gets your speculation is that it basically from the point of view of the macro scale it looks like a, it's 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 a, it's neutral. I think so. I haven't done any kind of studies mm -hmm. on that. I'm just asking you to speculate on that. Do we know? For sure. I mean I, I think the, sure. the point is that it's easily ionizable. Right. You know what I mean? But yes. It's sitting around and it's, it's charge neutral. Okay. What are the two curves? Uh, I think one is uh, an, like an average fit of it. Because uh, another plot I've seen, it just it doesn't have this dotted line. I think this is just to make it a little easier to look at. I got this out of Stavis paper. I didn't see an explanation for it. Okay, so this is like a cartoon version of the doping region. So here you have the AG rich region and then you have the AG poor region. And also we know that these exist besides the EDS data is that we have this double RC circuit in there. Um, and so you have one RC circuit that is representative of the poor region and then one that's uh, representative of the rich region. And also because this is, su is such a large kind of portion of this whole device, this is what helps the filament to be stable. So like I said, like the diffusion is limited, so the filament can't dissolve away. Uh, and during the formation, the thickest part of the filament is actually down in this AG poor region, but the thinner part is going to be in this AG rich region. And then, but this concentration helps essentially keep that uh, filament in contact, uh, in um, <laughs> stable, I guess. All right, so now I'm going to explain what retention is. So uh, here we have a plot, the, the, I have a hatched region, this is about the high resistance state. So what retention is, is what we do is we program a device to a, a state using say a compliance current. Uh, and then what we do is we observe it over time to see if it's maintaining that state. So it's retaining if it keeps the state. If it, that switches to a high resistance or if a high resistance state switches to a low resistance, we assume that it's no longer retaining its original state. And then also here you can see for different compliance currents, like the higher the compliance current, the lower that resistance gets goes to because you're essentially applying the voltage longer to get to that point. And then more silver is pulled through so you have a thicker conductive filament. All right, so next I'm going to get in, go into the effects that radiation has in these devices. See, I'm seeing double vision with this thing. Yeah, it's weird. <laughs> Okay, so well, you need to understand how radiation can even affect these devices. So in the high resistance state, the high resistance state is, is defined by the thickness of the device layer and then the silver doping. Uh, so obviously the thickness is not going to change, it's a material property, or that's a property of the fabrication. Uh, but the AG doping can change, theoretically. But since we do dope it to the 33% atomic uh, uh, concentration, this is going to be heavily limited. So the only way that we're going to really get this to change is if the electric field is disturbed enough to start driving it into the, into the, um, the AG pore region. So it needs an extra field to push it through. The low resistance state will be disturbed if this filament 
is in any way modified. So either silver is drawn to it, so it'll put it into a lower resistance state, or if silver is pulled away, it'll go into a high resistance state. So on the filament, we have two forces. We have this diffusion force, which is hopefully small due to the doping. But then we also have this electric field, this inherent electric field, because there's a, about a 0.9 volt uh, difference between the anode and the cathode. So you have this kind of inherent field that's directed down towards the cathode. And that might be what's also helping to maintain that filament. So during your radiation, what we're going to do is we're going to get electron hole pairs that build up in this layer somewhere. Um, so we need to, I guess, think through like how those ge that generation of electron hole pairs can affect uh, either the electric field, well, mostly just the electric field. All right, so here I'm going to go through the electric field of these devices. So here is a representation of the, a very crude band diagram of this device. Uh, so we have this like 0.9 volt difference across the <laughs> silver to the nickel. And so you have an electric field going this way. And then when gamma rays come in, they will make electron hole pairs throughout the device. Why? <laughs> Crude is positively vulgar. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best I could do in, in PowerPoint. What's that? Why do you have that little, little increase there, that little? So this here? Yeah. I'm yeah. going off of the band diagrams that Mekti gave me. OK. So what do you think it is, though? Um, I would assume some kind of. Um, well, that's, a, that's that's the that's a change in essentially the slope of the potential or not potential the the energy, right? Mm-hmm. Because that's the energy exactly. band diagram, right? Yeah. So you have. So here you have the. I don't have it on here, but this would be the the Fermi energy going across. So can you? Given that kind of change, you know, it looks like you got a change in your energy and then this kink, can you tell me what's happening to the field? So it's, it would, should be getting stronger there because you have a... Stronger point in which direction? Uh, also towards the, the nickel. And in your experience, is that a... it's getting more positive? Uh, it's... In that region? Yeah, because um, I'm I mean, blank. is it changing instantaneously, or is it kind of changing continuously? And getting bigger? it's it's changing. It, it I'll I'll show you on the next slide. Next but slide, it, I think. Yeah, it's it, better. Yeah. Um, but it, so, anyways, uh, <coughs> what I want to get a point on this slide is you have the generation right here. Oh. <laughs> okay, so our highest um, uh, dose rate that we used was uh, 210 rad silicon per second. Uh, this was the stuff from Sandia. Uh, so using this equation, we have the dose rate times the density of the material divided by approximately two times the band gap. Uh, so here's two times the band gap of germanium selenide. Here's an estimate of the density. It's somewhere between, say, six and a half and nine, depending on the paper and calculation use. <laughs> oh, sorry. Just remind us non-nuclear people what the 210 rad co the brackets silicon is. So this is the amount, essentially the amount of energy that the material absorbs per second. Um, so rad is what, ergs per gram or something like that. Uh, just as a matter of interest, do you know why they don't just ergs. use units of energy rather than these crazy rad? It's 100 ergs per gram. Yeah, 100 ergs. <laughs> so that, not one erg per gram, 100. Well, the, the gray, the SI unit. The gray, yeah, that seems gray, gray. Is, is back to your, to your um, you know, joule per ah. kilogram. Right? Oh, that's so, the uh, uh, And there's an actual, just a, it turns out to be a simple factor of 100 difference between the rad and the, and the, and the gray. gray? And yeah. 100, 100 okay. rads will buy you a gray. Okay, okay gotcha. Uh, awesome, oh, thank you. They, they wanted their own units? Yeah. A tradition, something. <laughs> Well, actually, it's, it is an interesting question because I certainly see a lot of people, more people, when you expand out into the medical community, that they normally use gray. Mm -hmm. yeah, looks good, yeah. yeah. So I'm wondering if gray is the better way to go at some point. But anyway, uh, most of the uh, device physics stuff they use right, red. Right. So it's just tomato, tomato. Uh, every industry wants their own word. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
Um, okay. For some reason, we've been reluctant to a, to adopt the SI unit. Mm. <laughs> is what it mm -hmm. sort of comes down That's to. Maybe it's, maybe it's yeah. a military thing that all the military stuff's written in RAD, yeah. so nobody wants to change. Wants to change. Yeah. Astronomers still use CGS, so it's ridiculous oh. to defining yeah. the distance between here and the sun in centimeters. Yeah. <laughs> it's so, all my astronomy textbooks. I want to talk to you about this EP, though. What yeah. is that EP? Um, that's like the ionization, the, the energy needed to ionize the electron. So the band, and so you just multiply by two? Yes. Do you know what the, uh, the EP is for SiO2? Roughly. Uh... Two, maybe? Well, what's the two band two. gap of SiO2? Isn't it? Do you think it's small or big? I don't remember. It's, I remember there's a well, one and a three. Do you think it's small or big, though? <laughs> big? It's big. It's about a nine. Nine. Okay. So we're getting around there. Yeah. So what would EP be the, for that guy? About 18. Okay. 18 to 20. Yep. Okay, so here's the electric field. So here's a better, there we go, a better representation of it. So that's what I was trying to go off of. That's why I said the other one was crude. So I know, so okay. <laughs> Actually, let me go back to the other one. Okay, so when you the Fermi levels align, your um, the vacuum level will also will also bend. So this here is going to be the affinity here. And so that affinity is going to maintain over the device. So the reason this bends is because this this has been shifted down to align with the Fermi energy. And that was before the, well, we're going to see it right here, it looks like. Yeah, so this, yeah, so this blue line here, that's uh, within the pink dots here, that's the generation, the electric field with no radiation, so no electron hole pair generation. Uh, and then the next one is uh, 10 to the 21. So the, on the previous slide, I had that the estimated generation rate <coughs> was about 2e16, and then in future, and then in the simulations in the further slides, we just estimated this at 2 to the, or t uh, 10 to the 17, just to, to overkill it a little bit, overestimate. But even at 10 to the 21, which is significantly higher than 10 to the 17, you're not seeing any change in the electric field due to electron hole pair generation. Uh, and then we went ahead and continued to increase that generation rate. So these would be correspond to higher and higher dose rates. Uh, and when you get up to 10 to the 28 and 10 to the 31, you actually start to see uh, changes in the electric field. So this is log scale. This is not an inversion. This is just going to a really low um, uh, electric field. Uh, and so this is probably due because you do have the inherent field across there that when you're generating the electron hole pairs that they're starting to separate and go towards the contacts. Do you know what the mobility of your carriers were at this, for this simulation? Uh, is it 10 for the s electrons and... And 10 for the minus 5 for holes. Holes are slower? No, no, no. Oh, oh, oh wait. Reversed? Yeah, okay. Okay. Now, I want to ask you a few questions here. Um, the so even in all cases, I want to take a look over there. I'm, I'm going back to this whole thing of that that figure that we looked at, where the uh, the speculation. Nope, nope. Uh, go back a few more. The 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 actual data on the cross section, you know, the AG4 region. Yeah, this mm -hmm. one right here. Okay. So we have this whole thing about thinking about what's going on that might cause that sudden drop off in the silver concentration close to the, the cathode. Uh, cathode during photodoping. So now let's go forward. Okay. Next. I'm trying. It's not responding. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> uh, in all cases there, close to that cathode, we see this turnips disease in the electric field, right? Yeah. So this turnip is about five nanometers. Why is it turning up there? I would have think, I, I think it's just because of the well, what what's 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 E field the the derivative the integral of um, the voltage? Can you write it out for me? No, that's not correct. Or, 
No, no, you got it. Yeah, unfortunately, it's charge. yellow. Oh, that's a, not a good one. Do we have another one there somewhere? There is yellow. Only yellow. Wow. There's a reason why yellow is there. <laughs> um, it's dry yellow. Even the even it's a dry yellow. It's a pale yellow. It's not. It's not. It's. it's oh no! You just can't see it. At least I can. Yeah, anyway, I'm yellow, white, color blind. Huh? You have my tablet with you? I can't see it. Do, but I can't hook it up. It's okay. Let me just ask you then. Okay. It's it's an equation that relates potential or energy to electric field to something else. What's that something else? Down uh -huh. the derivatives and stuff. The equation is called the Poisson equation. <laughs> Here's a pen and a piece of paper. <laughs> if you want to write it out, you're welcome to do it, or you can try to do that. But you know what? Electric field is related to uh, the, it's the charge, charge, charge concentration, charge density. Yeah, that's good. So if we see a change in that uh, electric field, we the must be seeing a change in that in the charge density. Charge density, right? increasing. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what kind of change do we see? A positive change or a negative change? Uh, this, since it's shifting up, I would say it's an increase in elect uh, negative. Charge. Why not the other way? Why would you say negative? Uh, because it's shifting up in energy. Yeah, but the electric field is related how to charge. Is it negatively related to it or positively related to it? Uh, it's negatively related to voltage. That's true. That's, <laughs> That's correct. what I'm thinking. But is it? What's its relationship to charge? Um, I guess it would be a direct. Uh, so positive relation. It's positive relation. So therefore, what kind of what's the charge you think it's sitting there? Even without radiation, there's a pool of <coughs> some buildup of some kind of charge. What charge is it? Uh, that would be the the holes, because you yeah the accumulation of so holes. So there's this pool of, of positive charge there. Maybe not uh -huh. a lot. We don't know. We have to take a closer look at it. You got to get the simulation results. But there's this pool of positive charge sitting there. And <coughs> what do you think is going to happen to that the silver ions if they try to travel when they see this pool of positive charge? They'll they're not going to want to go there. Yeah, they don't. <laughs> so maybe that's an issue there. Right? Mm -hmm. Very simple explanation. I have a hard time believing it a little bit because I'm not so sure that you're going to have enough holes to offset this huge stampeding elephant mm -hmm. of, of diffusing uh, or transporting silver, but it, it could be enough to push the, the silver back silver ions and hold them there. And that could be the cause of that steep drop off. So going back actually to now that I think of it, the discussion you had about like whether the silver doped region is neutral or negative, positive, whatever. This is we're not even we don't have to speculate one way or the other yeah. on that. Well so it'd be it would be neutral because otherwise if it wasn't neutral when you're applying a bias that, that layer that, that poor region would get destroyed because all of it would be respond responding to the electric field that you apply. Uh, if you apply the bias even further though, you're going to, well, I, I don't know. My answer to you yeah. is I don't know. Yeah, okay. Because I mean when we apply the bias to create the, the conductive filament, I mean all we obviously have silver that's going down to the cathode. Oh, 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 yeah, no, this is all photo doping. Right. This is all photo diffusion type Right, of right, stuff. right. This, so this has nothing to do with the, the operation under bias. No. I'm sure the operation under bias swamps out those holes. They don't right. even, they're done. Okay. Right. But in the photodoping process, it may be enough to oh, hold them back. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Um, okay, so I have, so here is essentially something representative of the low resistance state. Um, so due to limitations with simulating, uh, we can't contact that because otherwise it just shorts everything out and it's like, what electric field? So, <laughs> but even even as this filament starts to create, you see the electric field increases because, I mean, that's expected since electric field is essentially the voltage across over the distance. So as for a set voltage, as that, that distance is decreasing, your electric field is going to go up. So here it goes up by an order of magnitude well, okay, from... Okay, so what we're looking at here a little bit. So, help us so here's the, the filament... So here, so this, is, this here is... The electric field, this is just the straight across electric field. In the next slides, I'll show you a more complicated view. Um, so this is just across this, the shortest distance there. Mm -hmm. 
What's the filament? This blue. Okay. Right there, that's the filament. So, uh, same kind of trend over here. As the generation rate increases, there are changes in the uh, electric field. Though it's nowhere near as it doesn't change as drastic as when it's just in a high resistance state. So and once again, the generation rate of 10 to the 21 is, not is basically no different than the radiation itself. Yep. Okay, so here. Oh, wait, 10 to the 21? Mm -hmm. Sorry. 10 to the 21. 10 to the 21, is that consistent with what about the milliwatt per centimeter squared? that's used in the standard photodopy process? Um, is that higher or lower than the gamma cell? I, for the dose, dose rate or, or generation rate? So, it, I mean, it should be higher, I would expect. I don't, I don't remember the exact, um, the wattage on the... the 10 milliwatts is, is per centimeter squared. Okay, so it's ten. Because, <laughs> uh, because so when I do when I do like the fabrication stuff, I know like the finals. So I know like the the deposited millijoules per area. Well, we did it yesterday. Right? Yeah, no, yeah, but I didn't know if that was related to what our actual process or if that's just arbitrary. Per square arbitrary number. Okay, so, so so ten milliwatts, yeah. Um, you remember? So you don't remember what the NG ended up being? It ended up being ten to the twenty-one. That's right. Correct. Mm -hmm. Close to ten to twenty-one. Yeah. So it's mm -hmm. really interesting is interesting. that even that wattage doesn't seem to be having any perturbation on the fields, which is very interesting. Anyway. Right. So onto the prettier graph. But it's still causing the diffusion to occur. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so this is the low resistance state, so the like the plot you had on the, the right side earlier. Um, but this <coughs> gives you a more kind of zoomed out view, and this is more two-dimensional. So these colored lines here, it's going from red to purplish, where this is, uh, it's the, the gradient for the electric field, so it's stronger where it's more purple there. Um, and then you have also the vectors for the electric field. And then this one, this is for the 10 to the 31. So this is our worst case scenario as far as what we simulated. And as you see, as the generation rate increases, the electric field is actually going sideways <laughs> away from the filament. So in this case, I mean, if your diffusion vector is also going out, even if it is small, your electric field is now going out as well. So if you have electron hole pair generation in the silver, if you're ionizing that silver, now you have a force pulling that filament apart. Would I have electron hole pair generation in the silver? I would think that it would ionize some of it. It might quickly decay into thermal energy and it'll heat up a little bit, but... Our, our theory is that the electron hole pair generation mainly occurs in the chalcogenide. I mean, that's where ionization is going to occur. Because mm -hmm. you have a band gap. Right. But if silver is easily ionizable, I would think that like hitting it with a gamma ray would knock an electron or two off. No. I mean, if we can do that with UV, I mean, that's the principle for the, the photo. The key to this effect here is that you're seeing at very high dose rates there, the, you know, like something you'd see from an ion, like it's ion that goes through, mm -hmm. you got a whole bunch of them, you'd actually see this, you could see this field pushing away from the filament. Mm -hmm. opposite so the one thing I'm th I just thought of right now is to simulate these, we can't necessarily just leave them floating. So there is a ground down here. There's a ground down here. So if this is becoming ionized, oh no, never mind. I never mind. Do that. They go the other way. Never mind. Ionized metal. Yeah. Okay. So never mind. But yeah, still, you have the electric field going outwards instead but it's of. It's very high rate. Yeah. This is yeah, 10 to the 31. It's a ridiculously high rate. Well, no, it's the rate that you would get if you had a big ion moving through there. Yeah. All right, and so here is the the plot for 10 to the 17. So this is the estimated for the 210 rad silicon per second. So the the higher dose rate that I used for my testing. And you see, it's of course since 10 to the 21 had no issues. Uh, it, you still have the electric field going towards the filament. So there's there's no observed change due to uh, a radiation. All right, so now I'm actually going to get into the testing that I've done. Okay, so here is the test that I performed at ASU. 
Uh, so we took three tiles of the, the crossbar PMC devices and we packaged them into dual inline packages. Uh, and then we went ahead and we swept these 30 times using uh, putting, by putting them in here and using the parameter analyzer controlled by LabVIEW. Um, so that allowed us to get a little bit of statistics on what the low resistance, high resistance, and it also made, made sure the devices are functional before we actually radiated them. So um, for the irradiation, I had five devices that were programmed to a high resistance state and then five that were programmed to a low resistance state using a one microamp compliance current. And then here is the board that we use uh, to mount the devices on while they were radiated in the gamma cell. So here you have the ISO dose lines. So the sockets are right along the same line. So that way you know you have about you have an approximate even dose throughout. Uh, and then here are the dose steps that we took measurements at. So initially the uh, state of the device was measured by applying a 10 millivolt uh, a read voltage. Uh, and <coughs> right before it was placed in the chamber. And then about every 24 hours or so, so every uh, 1,500 uh, minutes, we would take the devices out, transport them back to the lab, and then put them back in the test fixture, and then apply that 10 millivolt read voltage to see where the state was. And then except the only exception here is this last one, because this is done over Sunday, so we came back on a Monday, so that was a two-day exposure. But the dose rate, for uh, this test was at 530 rad silicon per minute, so about 8 rad silicon per second. And then here, I haven't mentioned it yet, we had some control devices. So we had two that were in the high resistance state and then two that were in the low resistance state. And you can, so, and then also the high resistance state is defined by this gray hashed area, which you might not be able to see from there. It's kind of blurred out. So, but anyway, so here, so here, right across here is the boundary for the high resistance state. <laughs> and I define the high resistance state as essentially the median uh, high resistance value that I observed during the testing. Uh, and then you can see on this plot also that the high resistance state was pretty stable. So these, this, the, the solid lines are the irradiated parts. So this is the mean of the five devices, and this is the mean of the the, low, the four low resistance devices. And one of the trends that we usually see with the devices programmed at a low compliance is over about a uh, maybe a thousand minutes, so a little under a day or so, uh, the device likes to creep up to a high resistance, but then it'll just kind of sit there. So there's some kind of settling time before it just decides that's the resistance it, wanna, it wants to be at. We don't normally see this trend at higher compliance currents. Um, but this is uh, one microamp. And you can see that the control devices also went up like that. So you see the control and the irradiated devices for both the high resistance and the low resistance, they trend equivalently. So there doesn't seem to be any kind of uh, um, uh, changes due to irradiation. So these devices, and there's no drastic change from high resistance to low resistance or vice versa. So it appears that uh, these devices are tolerant to 3.1 megarad, which is the maximum uh, total dose. And then here the, is the experiment that was done at Sandia. So on this one, so I forgot to actually mention in the other, well I did actually, that those devices were floating. So once they were put into that socket, there's no circuitry on the back, there's no wires, so those were, those those pins were left floating. Um, for the ones I did at Sandia, I actually had the PMC in a circuit. So I was able to apply a bias. I have a uh, resistive divider here, which let me observe the state on an oscilloscope. So I could essentially just hook everything up to the oscilloscope and just let it run. Uh, and then get everything in one dose step, don't have to just dis disturb the circuit. So for this one, the devices, this time it was in a 40 pin CDIP, so that way it allowed us to essentially access 20 devices instead of 14, like in the other one. So more <coughs> devices. Uh, they were programmed in the same manner as the uh, as the previous test, so they were swept with the parameter analyzer using LabVIEW. Five devices were erased in the high resistance state, and then four devices were programmed using a 100 microamp compliance current. So this is a little bit higher than the other, the other test. And then I also had two high resistance and two low resistance control devices that were outside the radiation chamber. Let me ask you a circuit question here. Hmm. 
simple one. Okay. And these oscilloscopes, sometimes you can actually have a 50 ohm impedance mm -hmm. input. What if you made a mistake and had a 50 ohm impedance input there? What do you think would happen? So, so well, what would the oscilloscope measure? What it would measure order? the resistance of the oscilloscope or the current going directly through the oscilloscope. So you'd have a high resistance in parallel to a low resistance. Even All in the a low resistance state, it would be a high resistance. So it should yeah. not interpret that very well, I think. Yeah. No, it washes it out completely because I you messed around that. with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You guys made that mistake. We didn't make the mistake. I just messed around just to make sure. Because cool. the, the one of the issues, with this, the reason I put this 10 kilo ohm in here to create that, that resistance uh, divider is because these devices were really hard, especially the ones that we used. We had like 10 to the 9 uh, ohms or so high resistance state. So it was hard to d resolve on the oscilloscope as is. So we actually, I had to do that resistance divider to knock that down a little bit to see, oh, to sure. actually observe that signal. And then 50 ohms, I just killed it. Like, it, you can never s tell if it's switched. Well, you didn't want that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I played around with it, too, because but this was the best configuration. Because ohms is way lower than the low resistance state. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, so here is similar to the chamber that I use. This isn't exact one. This is a public released photo. But here you can kind of see it. So this is taken through like probably a six inch oil filled window. So the, the oh, source wow, is okay. up. The source is actually up, it's a radiating. So it's the photo is taken outside uh, through that oil. That's why you have the, such the, the tan color there. Um, but so it's a, a round source and then you have all it with these pencils which are little tubes filled with the uh, um, cobalt 60 pellets and then our device is actually hung in a box in a uh, lead aluminum box uh, between the, these test tube stands so that allowed it to prop it up and so we could face the source you could actually put devices down in this bucket here but then things get really really hot so you have a high dose rate but things are going to start melting <laughs> so this is the planes hookup yeah in, uh, okay This place is nice, not a whole lot of people use it, so you can pretty much be like, just come in in the morning, be like, hey, can I use your stuff? And they're just like, yeah, sure, come out in a couple hours. Wow. So you don't have to schedule anything, you just go right out. Yeah. Um, but anyway, so again, we, the, it, we had one device that we were able to get like 10 functioning devices on, thankfully. <laughs> uh, and that was on a test board uh, that had circuitry up to ribbon cables. So we're uh, able to connect to every pin on the chip. Uh, and so then we had ribbon cables running out of the lead aluminum shield box um, and then it came out of the cell uh, towards uh, in the outer room where we had the oscilloscope and the control devices and all that. So uh, we were able to hook the ribbon cable out, hook it up to a box that converted those connections to BNC and then from there into the oscilloscope. So we were able to access every device individually. It was a 16 input oscilloscope <coughs> so we could just look at everything. And that's actually why my control devices were limited because I also had those hooked up. So it's just a limitation of the number of uh, connections I had. And they still had, I had set the oscilloscope to measure at 50 samples per second. Mm -hmm. And then I essentially just let that sit for about 20 hours or so and then just watched the sig and then recorded the signal in the oscilloscope. Uh, so again, this dose rate is a 210 rad silicon per second. Uh, it was one dose step up to the 10.5 uh, uh, mega rad. And on here you can see this is a low resistance state. Again, the high resistance state is ha the hatched gray, but you can't see that. <laughs> um, but for the high resistance and low resistance, we have perfect retention. So nothing is changing. Okay. And then here's the pink line here. The, the, the black is the exposed devices. The pink is the control devices. So it shows you that they're also not changing and I mean, the control devices weren't even really needed because everything's so flat. Is the sample rate about every five seconds or so, or one second? Uh, it was 20 samples per second. Wow. So that's why there's a lot of, I guess, data points. <laughs> and you can see the noise in the circuit throughout the day as well. But Remind us again why the... Uh, <laughs> And yeah, that data is just like a mirror image. Mm -hmm. Oh, because um, I think there's noise. 
on the circuit somewhere. Yeah. And so how I got these resistance values is, is I I also had the bias that I was applying as an input, and so I just took that and point for point just divided it out or whatever to to get to the resistance. Um, so any noise on that signal would show up in here. Any noise is bigger than the. Yeah. Kind of natural noise, so but I mean, everything's. I mean, I don't know why these are mirrored, but everything for the most part is moving together. So whenever you see noise, everything shifts, everything moves. Okay. So it's it's just a. It's so not this real. This is done in <laughs> situ while it's being radiated. Yes. Right? Yes. So has this device been switched again after the radiation? Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, they were functional yeah. afterwards. Uh, the lower distance is going backward all the time. Yeah, yeah. So this was uh, 100 microamps. Uh, I don't know why it programmed down so low. These devices did that for some reason. Um, but they were switchable afterwards. So uh, all of the data we've seen are all crossbar. Yes. You switch these though at a lower current, at a higher current. You, you LRS got to a higher current, right? Yes. This was actually. The other one was one microamp. Yeah, and the reason for that is the one the one I did here at ASU that was what we called batch three. And these are from batch four, and these ones had a lower high resistance state, and I couldn't get them to switch until I got to a higher compliance either. So that was the, I mean, I tried to stick to either one or ten. I like those values. The crossbars, at least for batch three, worked really well at the really low compliance currents. They started screwing up if you went higher than, say, 50 microamps. Um, whereas these ones are the opposite. I had to go over 50 microamps just to get them to switch. Have you made another batch of these things? Not yet. I was ordering Nick Lodge, and it just came in a couple weeks ago. Because we were out. And you charged it to me? Uh, I believe so. <laughs> you signed off on it. Deal. <laughs> How much was that? $60 for a gallon. Right. 60 bucks. And so, again, here is. <laughs> here's the electric <laughs> field in the, at this dose rate, so the 210 rad silicon per second. So this is what's going on on these, these, these in-situ devices. So again, there's no disturbance of the electric field, so that's probably why <laughs> there's no change in retention due to the radiation, because that electric field is holding that filament there. And then here's a comparison of how our devices compare against commercial NAND flash. <laughs> so I have multi-level programming and the single-level programming on here. Uh, and these, I picked the, uh, data that I could find that was done from no refresh mode. So this is equivalent to how we do our retention tests. What no refresh mode means is that they apply, they program it, and then they do a read voltage and check to see if it's maintained its state. Versus refresh mode where they reprogram it and then check it. Um, but in all these, as soon as you get to about 300 kilorad, they're at 100% failure. <laughs> Uh, Adesto did, right at that threshold, did tests up to, I think, 447 kilorad, um, and that, that's actually in uh, germanium selenide uh, uh, absorption. But it, the uh, conversion between uh, uh, silicon and germanium <coughs> selenide is pretty close. It's 1.3 or something like that. So it's... And germanium sulfide. Uh, these ones were selenide, I think. The CB around was the, the chip itself, like that something. Okay, I okay, I thought I saw in the paper that it was selenide, and I've seen a couple of papers. This one is probably the sulfide ones then. Yeah, it was um, Gen One though, I believe, right? Yeah, it was the old ones. Okay, um, but it's so sulfide. so I mean the sulfide ones are still similar to the selenides a little bit. There's the function, the 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 physics is the same. It's still uh, similar to PMCs where you're creating the filament. It's still resistive memory. Um, but they did a test at 447 and 0% errors. So at the very least, for commercially built uh, uh, PMCs, they're uh, already outperforming uh, NAND flash. And then our data shows that we're getting retention to uh, 10 megarad. So potentially, if they did this out further, we should maybe be getting failure somewhere out here. Mm -hmm. But still, significantly better than NAND flash for radiation environments. Yeah. Right. So what I've talked about so far is... <laughs> so what I've talked about so far is I've done radiation testing up to 3.1 megarads floating, 
and then up to 10.1 um, megarad silicon biased in situ measurements. And for both of them, perfect retention. So at least for these tests, it doesn't seem like there's any difference in as probably test performance as far as floating versus biased conditions go. And then also I showed on the last plot that PMC have a higher tolerance to ionizing radiation than flash memory. Thank you. This talk was sponsored by Peter Jung. Yeah. <laughs> I recorded this also, by the way. What, just now or ever? Uh, right now. Oh, for Yago. Oh, <laughs>